Section 22 of Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gloria Begeman, Somerville, South Carolina. Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harland. At Table the matter with which we have especially to do just now is the manners of the eater the table may be simply or elaborately laid as circumstances and taste dictate it goes without saying that every housekeeper will have her board as attractive in appearance as possible and that she will never omit the bowl or vase of flowers from the centre of it if her purse will not allow this decoration in midwinter she may substitute a potted plant or a vase containing a few sprays of english ivy or wandering jew the men never sit down until the women are seated each man draws out for her the chair of the woman who sits next to him even in the quiet home life this practice should be observed and husband or son must always draw from the table the chair in which the wife or mother is to sit and remain standing until she is seated the host is seated last as soon as all are at the table the napkin is unfolded and placed across the knees it need not be opened wide unless it is a small breakfast or luncheon serviette carving the roast if a man undertakes to carve game or a roast he should learn to do it well and quietly never sharpening his knife to the annoyance of his guests or rising from his seat for a better hold many women carve excellently but as there is a feeling that it is a difficult thing to do a clever guest who knows his hostess well will sometimes beg leave to take her place for the performance of this task when the hostess begins to eat the others follow her example all food must be eaten slowly and above all noiselessly many a fastidious person has had her enjoyment of her soup spoiled by the audible sipping of it by her vis-a-vis -vis or her next neighbor the soup should be lifted from the plate by an outward sweep of the spoon and taken quietly from the side and not the tip of the spoon it is bad form to break bread or crackers into the soup and the plate containing the liquid should never be tipped in order to obtain every drop of the contents fish is not to be touched with the knife there is reason for this the cutting of some delicate seafood with a steel knife affects the flavor of it and renders it less delicate the flesh is so tender that it may be cut with a silver fork and this is the only implement permitted in the manipulation the same rule applies to salads which are never by the followers of conventionality touched with the knife lettuce is before serving broken into bits of a convenient size to be carried to the mouth if this is not done the eater should cut it with the side of the fork or fold each bit over into a convenient size for eating uses of the knife it should not be necessary to remind people in this day that the knife must only be used for the purpose of cutting food when it has fulfilled this duty being wielded by the right hand the food being held in place by the fork in the left the fork is then taken in the right hand and the knife laid with the edge turned outward across the back of the plate it is generally supposed that all classes know the use of the knife yet in a fashionable restaurant there recently sat a handsomely attired woman carrying french peas to her mouth with the blade of her knife however it is not so long 
since chesterfield gave elaborate directions as to the proper way to eat with the knife other times other manners it is an atrocity to pile several kinds of food upon the fork mold them into a small mound with the knife and then dump the load into wide open jaws each kind of viand should be lifted a small bit at a time upon the fork mastication should be absolutely noiseless and the process conducted with the lips closed bread even when hot may be broken off a small piece at a time buttered upon the plate then eaten all hot bread should be torn open or broken with the fingers never cut into bits to butter a slice of bread by laying it upon the table or more disgusting still upon the palm of the hand is a relic of barbarism at breakfast and lunch the small bread and butter plate with a small knife is set at the upper left hand side of the place and the bread should be kept on it how to eat fruits such fruits as apples or peaches are peeled with a small silver fruit knife cut into quarters and eaten with the fingers oranges are peeled and then pulled apart as they may at breakfast be cut in halves and eaten with the aid of the sharp toothed orange spoon grapes should be eaten from behind the half-closed hand into which skin and the seeds then fall it is permissible to use one's knife to convey salt from one's individual salt cellar if no tiny spoon for this purpose is supplied but the salt shaker is a much more convenient device though in damp weather the maid must see that the salt will shake a mouthful must never be so large as to make it impossible for the eater to speak if a question be addressed to him while he is disposing of it nor can too great stress be laid upon the duty of slow eating and thorough mastication of all kinds of food not only does it add to the grace of the table manners but it prevents indigestion never touch the food on the plate with the fingers to push it upon the fork if anything must be used for this purpose let it be a bit of bread but if possible dispense altogether with assistance of any kind the fork should be equal to getting up all that is absolutely essential and comfort does not depend upon securing every particle of meat or vegetables with which the plate is supplied the spoon and the fork every year the spoon has fewer uses and the fork has more now when it is possible desserts are taken with the fork where a spoon used to be employed pie cake ice cream and firm puddings with all kinds of fruit are eaten with the fork some persons hold a fork awkwardly in an up-and-down fashion instead of in the proper graceful horizontal one of course the spoon is still essential for semi-solids such as custards creams and jellies there are a few things besides breads of all varieties which one is allowed to eat with the fingers such are saratoga chips olives and small bird bones these last to be taken daintily in the finger tips it is no longer considered good form to eat asparagus with the fingers although some very well-bred persons still do it it is certainly an ugly sight to witness one's opposite neighbor eating asparagus in this manner it is possibly not so unattractive as to see him eat corn from the cob but no better way of dispensing of this last vegetable has as yet been invented if corn is served on the cob the cob should be broken into two or three pieces before it is lifted to the mouth if one is so unlucky as to drop a fork or spoon allow the maid to pick it up and to bring a fresh one 
without making any comment whatever a glass of wine overturned however demands apology and the hope that the hostess's cloth will not be irremediably stained after dinner coffee at breakfast one may drink coffee with sugar and cream but when black or after dinner coffee is served in a small cup which is known as a demitasse cream should be omitted to ask for this when it is not on the table is the height of rudeness one should learn to drink one's after-dinner coffee without cream sugar is of course permissible there is sense in this dictate of fashion as in many of the other rules laid down by this seemingly arbitrary dame the coffee taken at the end of a hearty meal is intended to act as a settler to the repast and to aid the work of digestion this it does much more easily when clear than when qualified with milk or cream before drinking from a glass of water one should brush one's lips with the corner of the napkin after the salad course at a dinner and before the dessert is brought in the waitress removes the crumbs from the table using a tray or plate and folded napkin for this purpose when she does this it is bad form for the guest to lay in the tray any bits of bread that may be left at his place or to assist the waitress by moving his glass salt cellar or any other article that may be left on the table a good waitress removes salt cellars pepper cruets and such articles before crumbing the table leaving only the glasses at each place it is her business to do all this so quietly and deftly that the guests are scarcely conscious of it to further this end let the whole affair be attended to by the waitress and do not seem to notice any lapses on her part the finger bowl at the end of the meal the finger bowls are used the ends of the fingers are dipped in the water and the lips touched with these then mouth and hands are wiped upon the napkin which is left unfolded at the side of the plate if one is taking only one meal in the house if a longer stay is expected one may watch one's hosts to see what they do with their napkins and follow their example dinner over the hostess makes the movement to rise and she with the other ladies proceeds to the parlor there they are joined later by the gentlemen at an informal or family dinner the men and women may leave the table together the men standing aside to let the women pass out first and in the drawing-room cigars may be lighted by the men after they have asked permission of the women to smoke all these rules with regard to the company dinner apply to the family dinner as well one cannot be too careful in observing the laws of table etiquette in the family circle if one would be at ease in company avoid apologies one warning i would give to the hostess or homemaker do not apologize unless necessary if a dish is a signal failure say with an apologetic smile that you regret that such a thing was spoiled in the baking or that you fear the meat is very rare and unless the matter can be remedied let it go at that you but embarrass your guests and put them to the disagreeable necessity of reassuring you if you dwell upon the matter the host should never insist that one be served to any dish after it has been positively declined to do this is a mistake no matter how kindly the intention there is an old saying that one man's meat is another man's poison if your host insists however on helping you after your refusal you must for decorum's sake accept the food 
but you need do no more than taste it at a formal dinner one is not served a second time to any dish but at an informal dinner what are called second helps are quite permissible and convey a compliment to the hostess when a plate is sent back to the carver for a fresh supply of meat the knife and fork should be laid side by side upon it not held in the hand as some persons insist and when one has finished eating the knife and fork are laid in the same manner upon the plate the tines of the fork up the napkin the napkin must never be tucked into the neck of gown or shirt nor must it be fastened to the belt or the waistcoat button after one leaves the nursery one should be able to eat without a bib one of the characteristics of a well-appointed house is an abundance of fresh linen including clean napkins if possible at every meal certainly every meal at dinner a large napkin for dinner use is handsome but it may be too large for convenience no one wishes to be smothered by a young tablecloth as some one has called these immense serviettes breakfast napkins are distinctly smaller than dinner napkins minor table laws at breakfast a blue and white service is often liked and is certainly pretty at dinner the china may be as costly as one can afford if the purse is limited the plain white or gold band is a good choice making a quietly elegant appearance and being easily replaced in drinking coffee use the spoon to stir it slightly and to sip from but never leave the spoon in the cup when a fowl is carved if your host asks which piece you prefer it is entirely correct to express a preference and indeed you will probably embarrass him if you decline to do so a wine glass should be lifted to the lips by the stem not by the bowl a waitress should be cautioned against the common practice of handing dishes and particularly water glasses with the thumb stuck inside the rim never tip the soup plate to get the last mouthful the nervous habit some people have of playing with the silver or crumbling bread on the cloth looks very bad artichokes are broken apart with the fingers the heart being conveyed to the mouth on the fork one should sit easily erect at table at a convenient distance from the board do not sit on your spine if you are in doubt as to how to proceed with any course take a cue from your hostess eggs when boiled should be served in individual egg cups opened by lightly cracking the top of the shell with the knife and eaten from the shell by the aid of tiny egg spoons it should go without saying that when a dish is passed one should always take the portion one touches do not presume to make a choice of rolls or of fruit never put salt on the cloth to attempt to assist the waitress by gathering together the articles before you is a mistake leave that to her and appear unconscious of her presence while she is so engaged to hand a dish across the table is distinctly bad form this habit has been designated as the boarding house reach end of chapter twenty two section twenty three of marion harlan's complete etiquette this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by gloria begeman somerville south carolina marion harland's complete etiquette by marion harland chapter twenty three in the home as a man thinketh in his heart 
so is he declares the book of books and as a man is in his home so will he be abroad when the company manner rubs off one frequently becomes involved in some quite unexpected circumstance that scratches off the beautiful surface coloring if it be only as deep as the hue on the stained wood adjustable courtesy the manner that one puts on when one goes into a friend's house or dawns when one is in company is what may be called adjustable courtesy if it is not made of the best material it seldom fits well not long ago a friend drove with us by the house of a man whose society manners when first seen call forth admiration upon this particular spring afternoon he sat upon the veranda of his home as we approached and he met our glance he sprang to his feet bowed low and remained standing until we had passed what a pretty attention to pay to two women we exclaimed our friend gave a significant shrug and called our notice to the fact that the man's wife had before we came by driven up to the end of the veranda and that she was unaided climbing from a high trap in which she and her two little girls had been driving while her husband lolled at ease in a steamer chair it took the presence of a woman who did not belong to him to bring him to his feet looking back after we had passed we noted that he had again resumed his lounging attitude and that his wife was lifting the second child from the carriage such is adjustable courtesy it is not an everyday garment and is consequently worn only to impress strangers no one can afford to do the injustice to his better self of allowing himself to become careless toward those with whom he lives or to neglect the small sweet courtesies that should be found in the home if anywhere it is the home etiquette that makes the public etiquette what it should be this reminder cannot be repeated too often in many houses men forget to show the respect due to wife mother and sisters parents should train their sons to stand when a woman enters the room and to remain standing until she sits down the considerate husband rises and offers his wife the easy chair in which he is seated she knowing that he is weary after a hard day at the office will not take the chair but she will appreciate the little attention and love him the better for it the barbarous toothpick in the talk on table etiquette we have touched on many points but not on certain things that seem too petty to be mentioned as it is not supposed that persons of polite breeding need to be reminded of them it is only when one looks in on the home life of some so-called nice people that one feels that perhaps after all to call attention to these points would not be superfluous one of these is the use of the toothpick to wield this in company is barbarous to produce it at table is disgusting the idea of having a glass full of toothpicks upon the family board is as disagreeably suggestive and more disgusting than would be the presence of a bowl of water flanked on one side by a cake of soap on the other by a washcloth cleansing of all parts of the body should take place in the privacy of one's own apartment or in the bathroom tipping back the chair at table or in company is bad form one small child was broken of this habit when she lost her balance while swaying backward from the table on the two hind legs of her chair and gave her head a furious bump on the floor sobbing she was lifted to her feet and met the stern gaze of her father i am very glad he said 
to see that you are badly enough hurt to be reminded never to tip your chair again it is rude if some grown persons i know had received a similar lesson in childhood they might not offend the taste of others as they now do taking salt and butter taking butter from one's butter plate with the tip of a fork that has been already in one's mouth is another disagreeable trick the like may be said of the same way of helping one's self to salt if a small butter knife and salt spoon are not provided the tip of the knife may be used in their stead bolting food and pushing back one's chair without the preliminary and apologetic excuse me is the custom of some otherwise estimable householders it would be better to eat less if one's time be limited and eat slowly as food thus taken in a rush is of small use in the internal economy a few mouthfuls well masticated will possibly do more good and certainly produce less discomfort than three times as much swallowed in indigestible chunks and after the short repast has been partaken of let the master of the house set the example of common decency by uttering the conventional excuse me caring for the nails one hopes that it would be a difficult matter to find anybody so far oblivious of ordinary good manners as to clean his nails before others but let us blush to say it one does meet many men who clean and pare their nails in the presence of family and intimate friends perhaps it is due to the fact that a woman does not carry a pocket-knife that she is seldom seen doing this her manicure instruments are kept upon her dressing-table and it is in her own room that she performs this very necessary part of her toilet the ugly habit that many children acquire of biting the nails can be overcome by requiring them to wear gloves until they master it good taste in speech young people should be taught that the question of age in general conversation is tabooed that too much manner is as bad as too little and that a good manner is even more to be desired than good manners they should be instructed to say thank you not thanks to avoid photo auto etc saying instead photograph automobile or better motor car or simply car crowd as our crowd is very bad for circle set or group of friends a girl should never say hello and no one should use it at the telephone good morning yes well or the mention of one's name are courteous methods of beginning a telephone conversation waistcoat is to be preferred to vest modern usage trains children to say yes mother yes aunt clara no miss smith instead of saying yes ma'am no ma'am as of old only in the remoter districts of the south does the earlier fashion survive among grown people where it must be admitted to have a quaint charm when a child sneezes if he is well taught he will say quietly excuse me a rudeness that a man will perpetrate in his own home from which he would shrink in the home of another person is that of wearing his hat in the presence of women every mother should train the small boy of the house to remove his hat as soon as he enters the front or back door to do this will then become second nature and it would not be probable that he could ever be guilty of the rudeness of standing in hall or parlor and talking to mother 
sister or other feminine relative with his hat on his head one mother at least positively refuses to hear what her little son has to say if he addresses her with his head covered one may regret that with older men other women have not the like courage of their convictions a man's hat is so easily removed we wonder just why he should leave it on in the house even if he is going out again in a moment the man whose courtesy is not of the adjustable type will not do this and these remarks are absolutely superfluous as far as he is concerned nor will it be necessary to remind him to pick up the handkerchief thimble scissors or book that the woman in his presence lets fall even if she be his wife to assist the feminine portion of humanity comes natural to the thoroughbred courtesy in girls and just here i would say a word to the young person of the so-called weaker sex it is to remind her that she as well as her brother owes the duty of respect to her elders she is too prone to think that the boys of the family should rise for the older people should remain standing until parents are seated and should always be ready to run errands or to deny themselves for their seniors the duty to do all these things is incumbent on the girl or woman in the presence of those who are her elders or superiors the girl or young matron who reclines in an easy chair while her grandparent mother father or woman guest stands is as guilty of rudeness as her brother would be were he to do the same it is not on the men alone that the etiquette of the home depends indeed it is the place of the mother to see that little lapses in good breeding are not overlooked and she is the one who should by her unselfishness her gentle courtesy and unfailing politeness in even the smallest items show forth the spirit of true kindness on which all good manners are founded the cultivated voice we are all united in thinking that a well-trained voice ministers to the happiness of those about in a rare degree yet it is too infrequently remembered that the place to cultivate clear enunciation low tones and amiable inflections is at home teachers in elocution and voice culture may do a large part in bringing out latent powers but the foundation for the culture of the speaking voice should be laid at home high shrill voices choppy pronunciation a nervous speaking manner will render unattractive matter of a high mental quality mothers should begin early and work late on this important matter of cultivating the voices of their children voice quality and enunciation it should be realized are more important than pronunciation it is not a vital question whether a man pronounce the word exquisite with the accent on the first or the second syllable but children is a vulgarism though one hears it often truly of one who uses it it may be said his speech bewrayeth him the care of books respect for books is one of the lessons to be taught in a properly regulated house and by this phrase i do not mean respect for the contents that goes without saying i mean respect for the proper care of those best ministers to mind and souls children should be taught to handle books carefully to cut the leaves properly to open books without breaking the leaves apart at the back 
they should be instructed not to soil or to mark them and to put them back in place when not in use the person who lends books may keep a list of them and it is not discourtesy if the volumes lent are not returned within a reasonable length of time to ask for them many people who are quick to borrow are careless about returning the standard of ethics in regard to returning books is with many people as low as the general standard in regard to the return of umbrellas a bookplate is a great aid to the possessor of a library in keeping it together moreover a pretty bookplate seems to give a touch of individuality to one's volumes the next best thing to individual bindings and tooled leather is this slighter mark of identity in one's library one thing that makes for peace and etiquette in the home is the recognition of the rights of others for this reason one member of the family should never inquire into another's correspondence into his engagements social or otherwise or ask questions even of his nearest and dearest the fact that a man is one of a family every member of which is dear to him does not mean that he has no individuality or that he must share the secrets of his friendships or business matters with any one he should always feel in the home that any confidences he may care to give are most welcome but that such confidences are never demanded or expected respect for privacy in recognizing these rights of others one must remember that each person's own room is sacred to himself it is inexcusably rude for one member of a family to enter the room of any other member without first knocking at the door and receiving permission to come in each human being should feel that he has one locality that belongs to him where he can be alone unless he decrees otherwise to further this end the wife should knock at her husband's door before she enters his room and the husband should show her the same consideration while brothers and sisters should always give the warning tap which is virtually a request for permission to enter before opening the door that the occupant of the room has closed americans are much criticized for their fondness for rocking chairs certainly there are many of us who should learn to use them less violently the woman who rocks steadily back and forth while she is talking to her friends is lacking in the repose that is an essential element of charm equally bad habits are the snapping and unsnapping of a purse and twisting a handkerchief or a theatre program into a roll to hum below the breath when someone else is talking is extremely rude and not less so when any two people are together courtesying for little girls for little girls the courtesy of our grandmothers has been revived it is certainly a charming mark of respect for them to show to older people a courtesy that should never be omitted is the asking of permission to open and read letters received while one is in conversation with others children should be rigidly instructed not to ask for delicacies of food when they are visiting otherwise they may become a nuisance the habit children often acquire at school of sticking their lead pencils into their mouths to moisten them is unhygienic and ugly and should be broken up end of section twenty three Section 24 of Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. 
all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by diana schmidt marian harland's complete etiquette by marian harland chapter 24 in public the subject of this chapter is so large that we almost despair of doing more than touch on a few of the many points it should cover perhaps it would be well to give first a few rules for that most public of places the street a man and his hat the question as to the etiquette of raising the hat is one that demands attention and yet the rules are simple a man always uncovers his head completely when he returns a woman's bow he does the same when he meets a man he knows walking with a woman whether she be known to him or not when a man is walking or driving with a woman and she bows to a man or a woman she meets her escort lifts his hat on parting with a woman he bears his head if he stand and talk with her he should hold his hat in his hand unless she asks him to cover his head or unless the day be cold in which case he says will you pardon me if i put on my hat then when he leaves her he again uncovers as a safe rule in whist is when in doubt lead trumps so a safe rule for a man in public would be when in doubt take off your hat some men of fine feeling take off their hats when a funeral procession passes them in the street indeed in europe this is an established custom in the south in this country old-fashioned gentlemen sometimes raise their hats to each other abroad men who pass women on a stairway invariably lift their hats in hotel elevators gentlemen always take off their hats when ladies are present some men do it in all elevators under these circumstances when a man meets a woman on the street and wishes to talk with her for a moment he should if time allow turn and walk a little way with her rather than stop and thus hinder her if he have a business engagement that makes this impossible he should apologize for not doing so in a few words as pardon me for not walking with you instead of stopping you but my train leaves in fifteen minutes or i have an appointment in ten minutes on a cold day when a man stands talking with a woman with his head uncovered she should say pray put on your hat i am afraid you will catch cold he should accede to her request saying thank you as he does so it is a woman's place to bow first when she meets a man unless they are old friends the man does not lift his hat until he has received this sign of recognition from a woman men who were called on to shake hands with women formerly murmured an apology for the glove but this is no longer customary a man waits for a woman to make the first move to shake hands unless he knows her very well when men meet each other on the street they may recognize each other as they please by a nod a wave of the hand or by touching the hat for a man to touch his hat to a woman is an insult unless he be a servant as a coachman receiving an order from his mistress when he acknowledges the order by touching the brim of his hat with his hand did more men appreciate that they were giving the coachman's salute to a woman mortification if not courtesy might prevent a repetition of the offence on the street car when a man is a woman's escort and they board a street car she should without comment allow him to pay her fare when they get on the same car by chance she should make the move to pay her fare but if the man hands the money to the conductor before she does she should simply bow and say thank you to dispute about who shall pay car fare is bad form meaningless introductions in street cars and other public places are to be avoided it is not desirable to bring two people together in such a place unless some real purpose is served lounging in public 
women should be careful as to the way in which they sit the woman who spreads her knees looks as awkward as the man who keeps his tightly together recently it became a fad in certain places for women to lounge in the street car and to cross one knee upon the other needless to say really well-bred women did not follow the fad even men who have been strictly trained will not cross the knees when calling on ladies when all seats are taken in a car and a woman enters a gentleman will rise and give her his seat lifting his hat as he does so which courtesy she should always acknowledge by saying thank you cordially and audibly women are much criticized for taking seats in cars without an acknowledgment of the courtesy and undoubtedly they often do on the other hand men as frequently by turning their backs make acknowledgment impossible if the car be full and a woman enters carrying a baby in her arms any girl or young matron present should resign her seat to the burdened passenger unless some masculine passenger has manliness enough to do so to the credit of human nature be it said that we have never seen a mother with a child in her arms stand for two minutes no matter how crowded the car might be of course a young woman should resign her seat to an elderly woman as she will do the same for a very old or infirm man when walking together the custom of a man and a woman walking arm in arm at night is rapidly falling into disuse for couples to walk in this way in the daylight has not been customary for years unless the woman be so aged or invalided as to need the support of her escort's arm now even after dark there is hardly any need of a man's arm for a woman's guidance in the brilliantly lighted streets if the couple be walking through a poorly illuminated street or on a country road or climbing a steep hill the man offers the woman his arm he should also do this at night when he holds an umbrella over her head even in the daylight when they cross a crowded thoroughfare together he should lightly support her elbow with his hand to pilot her over he should never unless they be members of the same family take her arm in order to guide her in public a man must never attract a woman's attention by clutching her arm or odious action by patting her on the shoulder or back or nudging her if there is such a noise about them that the mere speaking her name in a low voice will not reach her ears he may respectively touch her on the arm saying at the same time excuse me please personal liberties are always in poor taste but never more vulgar than in a place where they are noted by all observers after the theater if a man escort a woman home she may utter a brief thank you to him on parting with him profuse expressions of gratitude on such an occasion are bad form on parting from him after he has taken her to the theatre opera or any other entertainment she may when she bids him good night say cordially i am indebted to you for a very pleasant evening and if she wish she may add we shall be glad to have you call at any time a man must never linger at a woman's door to utter his good-byes or to speak a few final sentences doorstep chats may do for nursemaids and their attendants they are out of place in higher circles a man rings the bell for the woman he is accompanying sees that she is safely admitted and if it be too late for him to enter the house for a few minutes removes his hat says good night and takes his leave kissing in public so much fun has been made of the custom that some women have of kissing each other in public places on meeting and parting it is surprising that even gushing girls still adhere to the ridiculous fashion when people embrace let it be in the sanctity of the home or where there are no amused observers if a kiss has no meaning then let fashion do away with it 
if it means tender affection it is too sacred a token to be exchanged where dozens of people may look on and comment on it it is hardly too sweeping an assertion to make when one says that among mere acquaintances kisses are best omitted altogether do let us have some method of salutation for those we really love that is not given as frequently and freely to every chance acquaintance or casual friend one woman declares that beyond her relatives there is no grown person she willingly kisses except two women whom she has known for years and she respects them too much to embrace them in the presence of an unsympathetic world a warm hand clasp will suffice until the people who love each other can be alone of course there are exceptions to this rule as to many others when a man puts his family upon the train or boat which is to carry them from him he will uncover his head and kiss each one of the beloved group other such exceptions will suggest themselves common sense and good taste should keep one from making a mistake in these matters good form in names it is in wretched form for a man to speak of a woman by her first name when talking to casual acquaintances it is as bad form or nearly as bad for a woman to speak of a man by his last name as brown or smith it takes very little longer to say miss mary or mr brown and the impression produced is worth the extra exertion nor unless they be members of the same family does a man address a girl by her first name in a crowd of outsiders in her home she may be mary to him in public let him address her as miss smith one of the most annoying habits indulged in public is that of being late at the theatre it is trying to have to lose whole lines of a play while one rises gathering up bonnets and wraps to do so to allow the belated person to pass who sits beyond one it is a pity that the theatre-goers do not take more pains to show one another the kindness of being in their places before the curtain rises in entering a theatre the man stands aside to allow the woman to go into the door ahead of him then steps forward to show his tickets to the usher at the same time taking two programmes from the table or from the boy holding them the coupons are handed back to the man and kept by him in case any mistake should arise in regard to the seats then the woman follows the usher down the aisle followed by her escort in some western cities the man goes first down the aisle standing aside to allow the woman to take the inner seat it is well for both men and women to remove their coats and wraps either in the vestibule of the theatre or before going into their seats after sitting down the woman takes off her hat and holds it in her lap throughout the performance disposing of one's wraps a better custom in theatres large and modern enough to have ample dressing rooms is for the woman to remove all her wraps there the house looks much prettier than when each woman is piled with her belongings the woman is more comfortable and she has had besides the opportunity of a glance in the mirror at her hair if she is at all sensitive to draughts she may prefer to take a light scarf with her as when the curtain rises there is often a very cold air especially on those sitting close to the stage in most cities in this country women do not wear full dress unless they are to sit in a box at all evening entertainments a woman's head is uncovered a woman who retains her hat even when sitting in a box inevitably suggests that she wishes to be conspicuous if a woman is invited to be one of a box party she need not bother to go to the dressing-room as in most cases each box has hooks on which cloaks may be hung and a mirror convenient for the single glance that is desired the same rules hold good with regard to a musicale or a concert talking at a concert 
i wish there were any chance that anything anybody might say could impress on women that their habit of talking or worse still whispering during a musical performance is abominably rude let those who have suffered by this almost universal practice testify to the misery it causes to have one's favorite passage from a beloved composer marred by now this is where he dies you know or just hear the thunder in that orchestra and now just listen to the chirping of the dear little birds or i don't think i can lunch with you tomorrow, dear but perhaps the next day do you think those long coats are becoming to short women who that has undergone the agony of being in the vicinity of such a talker can fail to utter a fervent amen to the frenzied petition that they may be suppressed the person who has seen the play before and who obligingly keeps his neighbors informed of what is coming next is an equal offender when america is played at public meetings when the national hymn is played it is proper for every one to stand and to remain standing until it is ended. End of section twenty four. Section twenty five of Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tracy Butterick. Marion Harland's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harland Chapter 25 Hotel and Boarding House Life There is no better place than a hotel in which to study the manners, or lack of manners, of the world at large. It is here that selfishness is rampant, and unselfishness hides its diminished head. Before we discuss the ethics of hotel life, it will be well to give a few general directions as to what one does from the time one enters the door of the building, which will, for a long or short time, be his place of abode. He proceeds at once to the office, makes known his desires with regard to a room or rooms, and writes his name in the register handed to him by the clerk. He is then assigned his room, and a page directs him thither carrying hand luggage. To this page he hands his trunk check, and the trunk is soon brought to his room. Upon the inside of the door in every hotel room is tacked a set of rules of the house, and these are in themselves sufficient to instruct our uninitiated traveler in most of what is expected of him. He here learns that the hotel is not responsible for valuables left on the bureau or table of the room that the guest is requested to keep his trunk locked and to lock his door upon going out and to leave his key at the office that valuable papers and jewelry can be left in the safe of the hotel at what hours meals are served and so on all these directions the considerate person will observe none of them is unreasonable there are many things for which no printed rules are given which are none the less essential to the correctness of demeanor on the part of a guest. At the hotel table. Loud talking is one of the things to be avoided. One must remember that in a hotel, more than in any other place, is the warning of the Frenchman likely to be proved true. The walls themselves, my lord, have ears. Each room has another room next to it, and the partitions are thin. The transoms all open upon a general hall in which can be heard any loud remark spoken in any one of the rooms. If one does not discuss affairs one wishes kept secret, one must bear in mind the fact that other people may be annoyed while resting, reading, or talking by fragmentary bits of conversation wafted to them. At the hotel table one must also bear this in mind. Loud talking in a public place stamps the speaker as a vulgarian, or a person who has seldom been outside of his own home, and has never learned to modulate his voice. 
On entering a hotel dining room, the traveler pauses until the head waiter or one of his assistants indicates a table at which he may sit. If this table be too near the radiator or window, or otherwise undesirable, the guest may courteously ask if he cannot be placed in another locality. When a man and a woman are together, the man enters the room first and leads the way to the table on the first occasion of their taking a meal at the hotel. After that, if they occupy the same table each day, the woman enters the room first and proceeds to her seat, followed by the man. He, or the waiter, draws back her chair for her and seats her. The man, of course, remains standing until she is seated. Giving One's Order the menu card is handed to the man with a pad or slip of paper and pencil. Upon this, after discussion with the woman, he writes his order. As a rule, he orders the entire meal except the dessert at once. The sweets can be decided on later. I wish I could impress on the minds of persons in a hotel that it is wretched form to criticize audibly the viands set before them. The person sitting near you is not edified to hear you remark that the soup is wretched, the beef too rare, the coffee lukewarm. If you have any fault to find, do so to the waiter, and in such a tone that the other guests cannot hear it. Avoid fault finding. Above all, do not scold the waiter for that which he is not to blame. He does not purchase the meat nor does he fry the oysters. Show him that you appreciate this fact and ask him politely if he cannot get you a better cut or oysters that are not burnt. Some persons seem to think that it elevates them in the opinion of observers if they complain of what is set before them. They fancy, apparently, that others will be impressed with the idea that they are accustomed to so much better fare at home than that they now have that it is a trial for them to descend to the plane on which others are eating. The fact of the case is that the person who is accustomed to dainty fare and to even threaded living is too well-bred to call the attention of strangers to the fact. While we are on this subject, it would be well to remind the thoughtless person that when he dines with a friend at the friend's hotel, on his invitation, he is a guest. It is therefore rude for him to comment unfavorably on the dishes on the table. When under such circumstances, a guest says to his host pro tem, My dear fellow, they do not give you good veal here. Or, Are you not tired of the mean butter you eat at this hotel? He is criticizing in an offensive manner the best that his host can offer him, since he has no house of his own in which to entertain. The guest should act as if it were his friend's private table and forbear to criticize fare or service. Hotel tipping. One of the often unconsidered items of expense in hotel life is the tips that one must give. In no other place is one's hand so often in one's pocket. A porter carries a bag and he must be tipped. Another carries up a trunk. He must be tipped. One rings for iced water, and the boy brings it, expects his ten cents. One wants hot water every morning, and in notifying the chambermaid of this fact, must slip a bit of silver into her palm. The waiter at one's table must be frequently remembered, and the head waiter will give one better attention if he finds something in his hand after he shows the new arrival to a table. And of course, on leaving, one will also give a fee. So it goes. When, however, one is staying by the week at a hotel, tips need to be given only once a week, unless some unusual favor is asked. We may rebel against the custom and with reason, but as not one of us can alter the state of affairs, it is well to accept it with good grace or reconcile oneself to indifferent service. Children in a Hotel the matter of children in a hotel is one on which so much has been said and written that there is little left to say. At first glance, one is tempted to resent the fact that many hotel proprietors object to having children accompany their parents to the public table, and that some even demur at the presence in their house. 
child lovers have said bitterly that the celestial many mansions seem to be the only abodes in which the little ones are welcome and all these opinions have a great deal of truth on their side but it is not until one has undergone the annoyance of ill-governed children in a house where there is no restrictions enforced on them that one sees the other side of the shield one large boarding house at a fashionable summer resort is popular to mothers of large families because the proprietor does not object to children a guest there last season decided that if that were the case said proprietor had no nerves she soon learned that childless guests declined to stay at the place children raced up and down the long corridors screaming as they went they played noisily outside of bedroom doors they ate like little pigs at the hotel tables in short they made the house a purgatory for all except other children and their mothers two types of mothers there are two types of mothers in this land of ours that are greatly at fault one is the mother who hands the management of the children over to a nurse or several nurses and she is of course the rich woman whose children see her seldom and that not often enough to bother her the other type is the woman who has the nerves toward all things except her own children's noise she is such a doting parent that she is to all appearances blind and deaf to the fact that her own offspring drive to the verge of insanity other grown-ups with whom they come in contact verily the american youngster is having everything his own way in private and public nowadays dwellers in hotels are to be pardoned if they beg that he is to be kept in private until his parents learn to govern him and by thus doing show mercy to other people while the rules that govern propriety should be adhered to everywhere there is no other place where they should be more strictly observed than at the summer hotel or the boarding house of a fashionable watering place it may not be an exaggeration to state that there are few decent places where they are more openly disregarded with trammels of city life one seems to lay down an appreciation of the fitness of things generally the free intercourse the rapidly made acquaintances the mingling of many sorts of people in the huge caravansary tend to make us cast aside conventionalities husbands running down from the city for a sunday with their wives find them absorbed and happy in the gay life about them and quite sufficient unto themselves when the husbands return to counting room and office on monday morning there is always a class of men who having nothing else to do are habitues of the summer hotel where they flirt with the wives of other men and make themselves generally useful and talked about avoiding gossip there may be no harm in all this sort of thing but it is well for the discreet maiden and matron to avoid giving any cause for the enemy to blaspheme in other words for the gossip to make herself busy and dangerous to this end late hours in shaded corners of verandas moonlight sails and walks and beach promenades well on toward midnight are to be shunned while these may be innocent per se they give rise to scandal the young girl may always have a chaperone to whom to refer as to the proprieties but it is not the young girl who is most talked about the married woman whose husband lets her have her own way is a law unto herself and she must be careful not to make that law too lax it takes very little to set silly tongues wagging it takes months and years to check the commotion they have made promiscuous friendships promiscuous intimacies at summer resorts are a great mistake unless a woman knows all about a fellow guest she should not get into the habit of running into a room or of talking with her as with a lifelong friend she may be pleasant toward all and intimate with none it is a well-known fact that there is no other hotbed of gossip equal to a hotel or boarding-house women released from the cares and anxieties of housekeeping and homemaking turn their time and thoughts to fancy work and scandal each arrival runs the gauntlet of criticism and comment and afterward becomes the subject of confidential conversations upon veranda and in parlors 
Here, as everywhere else, work that will occupy the mind is a sovereign cure for this habit. One can usually sit in one's own room, but if one does not, there is always a book to be read in parlors or on the veranda, which will show the would-be gossip or retailer of scandal that one is too much occupied to engage in conversation. Two good rules. Certainly in a hotel no one lives unto himself, but each must consider the comfort of his neighbor. Such a semi-public life is at the best a poor substitute for a home existence. Two rules to be observed will make other rules of hotel or boarding house etiquette sink into insignificance compared with their importance. First, do nothing that will make others uncomfortable. Second, Pay attention to your own business and pay no attention to that of other people. End of section 25. Recording by Tracy Butterick. Section 26 of Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gloria Begeman, Somerville, South Carolina. Marion Harland's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harland. Chapter 26. In the Restaurant. The woman who, for the first time, is taken to dinner in a large restaurant is naturally slightly confused by the experience. She needs, however, to know only a few essential points in order to be able to conduct herself with propriety and to enjoy her evening. She and the man who has taken her will leave their wraps in charge of the maid or hat man at the door. If she has worn a hat, she will retain this, but if she has gone in a carriage or a car with only a light scarf about her head, she need not be embarrassed, for many of the women in the room will be without headgear. In this country, it is not customary for women dining in public places to wear gowns cut more than slightly low. When the two are shown to their table, the woman should remove her gloves, keeping them in her lap, or perhaps putting them on an empty chair that is near. Neither the gloves nor a handbag should ever be placed on the table. The man should do the ordering, but as he will consult his guest's wishes, she should be prepared to express these definitely and with sufficient promptness not to keep the waiter standing too long. Unless something very elaborate is desired, a plate of raw oysters, a little fish or a bit of bird, a salad and a sweet with coffee, with the things that go with them, will suffice. The custom as to ordering is not the same in all restaurants, and if two women be alone, the one who is acting as hostess should ask whether the waiter wants the entire order at once or not usually a slip of paper and pencil are given which saves the possibility of a mistake on the part of the waiter frequently the portions of meat and salad and of some other dishes are abundant for two persons but it will be well to make a friend of the waiter to the extent of asking if this is the case the habit of certain fussy people when eating in a restaurant of wiping off their plates before they are served is intolerable and foolish it is unpleasant for other people besides if the plates are not clean there is no ground for faith in the napkins to snap the fingers at a waiter is to stamp one's self as a vulgarian a moderate order order within your means and display no anxiety when toward the end of the meal the waiter lays your bill face downward on the table when you are ready to pay it satisfy yourself that it is correct and place on the waiter's tray a sum sufficient to cover it and the amount of the tip custom says you must give 
if a mistake has been made a quiet word will usually prove a sufficient remedy the menu card for the benefit of the woman who for the first time is confronted with the elaborate menu card of an expensive restaurant the following explanation of terms is given aspic meat jelly au gratin dishes covered with crumbs and browned au naturel plain simple potatoes cooked in their jackets are au naturel barbecue to roast any animal whole usually in the open air bisque soups made thick with mints and crumbs blanche to parboil to scald vegetables nuts etc in order to remove the skin blanket any white meat warmed in a white sauce thickened with eggs bouillon a clear broth bouquet a sprig of each of the herbs used in seasoning rolled up in a spray of parsley and tied securely cafe au lait coffee boiled with milk cafe noir black coffee camembert a brand of fancy cheese canapé usually toast with cheese or potted meat spread upon it sometimes made of pastry cannelon meat stuffed rolled up and roasted or braised capers unopened buds of a low trailing shrub grown in southern europe pickled and used in sauces capon a chicken castrated for the sake of improving the quality of the flesh caramel a syrup of burnt sugar used for flavoring custards etc and for coloring soups casserole a covered dish in which meat is cooked sometimes applied to forms of pastry rice or macaroni filled with meat champignons french mushrooms charlotte a preparation of cream or fruit formed in a mold lined with fruit or cake chervil the leaf of a european plant used as a salad chilies red peppers chives an herb allied to the onion family chutney a hot acid sauce made from apples raisins tomatoes cayenne ginger garlic shallots lemon vinegar salt and sugar comfitures preserves compote fruit stewed in syrup consomme clear soup cream sugar and butter is to rub the sugar into the butter until they are well incorporated then beat light and smooth creole a la with tomatoes croquettes a savory mince of meat or fowl or fish or mashed potatoes rice or other vegetables made into shapes and fried in deep fat crustad a kind of patty made of bread or prepared rice croutons small bits of crusted bread used in soups or as garnishes croutons bread dice fried crumpet raised muffins baked on a griddle curries stews of meat or fish seasoned with curry powder and served with rice debris a brand of fancy cheese demitasse a small cup term usually applied to after-dinner coffee deviled seasoned hotly eclair pastry or cake filled with cream in coquille served in shells endive a plant of the composite family used as a salad entrees small made dishes served between courses at dinner entremets second course side dishes including vegetables eggs and sweets farsi stuffed 
fillets long thin pieces of meat or fish generally rolled and tied fine herbs minced parsley etc thinnen haddock haddock smoked and dried fondant melting boiled sugar the basis of french candy fondue a preparation of melted cheese french dressing a simple salad dressing of oil vinegar salt pepper and sometimes mustard galantine meat boned stuffed rolled and boiled always served cold glace iced glaze stock boiled down to a thin paste grilled broiled gruyere a brand of fancy cheese hors d'oeuvres relishes jardinier a mixed preparation of vegetables stewed in their own sauce a garnish of vegetables julienne a clear soup with shredded vegetables cumis milk fermented with yeast lardoon the piece of salt pork used in larding lentils a variety of the bean tribe used in soups etc marins chestnuts mayonnaise a salad dressing made of oil the yolks of eggs vinegar or lemon juice salt and cayenne meringue the white of eggs whipped to a standing froth with powdered sugar mousse ice cream made from whipped cream noodles dough cut into strips or other shapes dried and then dropped into soup nougat almond candy paprika hungarian sweet red pepper pate some preparation of pastry usually a small pie hence patty pans pate de foie gras small pie filled with fat goose liver p s de resistance principal dish at a meal pilo east indian or turkish dish of meat and rice pimento jamaica pepper pimplas small olives stuffed with pimento example sweet red pepper piquant sharply flavored as sauce piquant a highly seasoned sauce pistachio a pale greenish nut resembling the almond polenta an italian mush made of indian meal or of ground chestnuts potage a family soup potpourri a highly seasoned stew of divers material meat spices vegetables and the like a spanish dish puree vegetables or cereals cooked and rubbed through a sieve to make a thick soup ragout stewed meat in rich gravy ramekins a preparation of cheese and puff paste or toast baked or browned rechauffe anything warmed over rissoles minced meat made into rolls covered with pastry or rice and fried risotto rice and cheese cooked together an italian dish roquefort a brand of fancy cheese roti roasted roulade meat stuffed skewered into a roll and cooked roux butter and flour cooked together and stirred in a smooth cream a white roux is made with uncooked flour a brown with flour that has been browned by stirring it upon a tin plate over the fire Sami, a warmed over dish of game well seasoned saute to fry lightly in hot fat or butter not deep enough to cover the thing cooked scalpion a mince of poultry ham and other meats used for entrees or it may be a mixture of fruits in a flavored syrup scones 
scotch cakes of flour and meal shallot a variety of onion sorbet frozen punch soubise a sort of onion sauce eaten with meat souffle a trifle pudding beaten almost as light as froth then baked quickly supreme white cream gravy made of chicken tarragon an herb the leaves of which are used for seasoning and in flavoring vinegar tartar as a sauce tartar tart acid timbe a small pie or pudding baked in a mold and turned out while hot to braise meat cook in a covered pan in the oven with stock minced vegetables and peas beans etc whole and with savory herbs to marinate to cover with lemon juice or vinegar and oil or with spiced vinegar truffles a species of fungi growing in clusters some inches below the surface of the ground used in seasoning and for a garnish tutti frutti a mixture of fruits velute a smooth white sauce volovent light puff pastry baked in a mould and filled with chicken sweetbreads or other delicate viand zwieback bread baked twice end of section twenty six section twenty seven of marion harlan's complete etiquette this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by diana schmidt marion harlan's complete etiquette by marion harland chapter twenty seven when traveling the selection of proper receptacles for one's baggage is the first point to be considered in making preparations for a journey the trunk makers offer great variety in the material quality and price of their wares the indispensable requisite of a trunk whatever be the material of its composition is that it shall be strong look well to hinges lock and corners before buying a trunk that will not stand wear and tear is not worth having one need not purchase an expensive trunk but one cannot afford to purchase a cheap one the material employed must be good though the appearance need not be luxurious if one can afford the price one may find trunks where separate trays are provided for each gown or where indeed frocks may be hung at full length and come forth at the end of a journey as they might come from my lady's closet but for those who cannot or do not care to put sizable sums of money into the carriers of their clothes there are good sensible receptacles at a moderate price a steamer trunk by reason of its shape and size is a convenient general-purpose piece of baggage and is especially to be commended for short journeys the traveling bag the bag one selects has much to do with one's comfort in traveling it should be large enough to hold a night robe a kimono one's toilet articles also an extra shirt waist and a change of underclothing in case of detention the size of the bag is important it must not be so large that it is a burden to carry if necessity compels it must not be so small that the articles mentioned may not rest comfortably and without crowding within as with trunks so in bags one finds a large variety in values it pays to get a good bag of nice leather conveniently arranged for carrying the articles necessary to one's comfort such a bag one that pleases the eye and in which one may find one's things without a distracting search for them gives an amount of satisfaction to a traveller beyond the power of words to convey 
one of the most acceptable gifts that can be made to a person who is not of the stay-at-home type is a generously fitted traveling bag as thousands of bags are made precisely alike the stamping of one's initials at the end or side may save time and trouble dressing for a journey one should wear dark inconspicuous clothing in traveling and of a weight suitable to the season of the year beflowered hats light gowns light gloves unless these are washable and jewelry are in the worst of taste and proclaim the unsophisticated or the parvenu to be dressed comfortably and modestly is the aim of the experienced traveller in summer a dark silk dress of light weight with a silk raincoat makes an ideal travelling costume as neither holds dust a woman so attired will arrive at the end of her journey in much better condition than her less experienced companion who clings to white blouses if a fresh veil and a pair of white gloves are tucked into her bag to be put on at the last moment she will be charmingly immaculate a black silk bag for the protection of one's hat is a good idea though most pullmans supply paper sacks for this purpose if possible it is well on a journey to carry with one something more in the way of money than one's travelling expenses one cannot tell what emergency may arise or what unexpected demands may be made upon one many women carry the funds not immediately in use in some sort of pocket fastened on or made into the petticoat they wear one can buy very pretty separate pockets of this sort made of leather or one can make them of a stout silk fastened down by a clasp on the flap elaborate preparation in caring for one's wealth is the penalty a woman pays for being without pockets in her clothes while it is wise for her to put the funds unnecessary for immediate use in some such safe place as that described she should not keep articles which she may be at any moment called upon to deliver in a spot which it is embarrassing for her to reach train conductors and baggage agents have many a grin and sly smile over the women who must reach under their petticoat before she can deliver up ticket and trunk checks an amusing instance of this overcaution, so much more characteristic of women than of men, occurs to the writer. An acquaintance, starting on a European voyage, took the most elaborate means for the hiding of her valuables upon her person. In transit, she stayed the night at a New York hotel and woke in the morning to discover, to her horror, that she had slept all night with the door of her room unlocked and the key on the outside a considerable amount of change in a separate purse from one's bills is a convenience and a safeguard making acquaintances a man may if he chooses make acquaintances on a journey and a woman also though with less frequency and freedom the exigencies of travel may sometimes make it pleasant for her to render or receive aid from another woman or possibly a man and this may be the starting point for acquaintance as a usual thing it is best for a young girl travelling alone to avoid all communication with strangers as she cannot know into what complications it may lead her comfort in a pullman if one is making a journey that compels night travel one must secure one's section or half section in the pullman or sleeper beforehand in order to get good accommodations it is well to do this several days in advance the difficulty of getting into an upper berth makes most women choose the lower though it is more costly and decidedly stuffier when one climbs aboard a train the porter follows with one's belongings finds one section or half section and deposits the hand luggage in its place some travellers are very thoughtless in appropriating more than their share of the space appointed for wraps bags etc if one has paid for a half section only one has no right to take more than that 
unless the other half of the section remains unsold when a traveller wishes his bed made up he should summon the porter and so declare usually an electric bell between the windows of his section will enable him to call the porter at any time if the traveller is a woman and is for any reason dissatisfied with her berth or section she may consult with the porter about a change which if the car is not full he is often able to arrange for her for instance if a woman having a lower section finds that the upper is to be occupied by a man it is often possible by the payment of a small sum to the porter to move her quarters the timid traveller dressing for the night many women who find themselves compelled for the first time to take a sleeping car feel timid at the prospect but the process is simple though not necessarily comfortable once behind the curtains a woman may remove all her clothing precisely as she does at home if she feel equal to the physical ordeal of putting it on again in a crowded space in the morning to the accompaniment of rapid motion and the nausea it often induces unless one is a good traveller it may be preferable to remove one's dress pinning the skirt to the inside of the curtain to save its freshness putting small articles in the swinging hammock next to the windows and for the rest merely loosening bands directly above the head one will find in all first-class trains a button that when pressed will give a light by which one can read or which will help one the better to endure an hour of nervous wakefulness a small bottle of brandy or spirits of ammonia is carried by delicate women to ward off train sickness a woman should not hesitate to summon the porter for extra covers a glass of water or any other service that contributes to her real comfort to send for him with too great frequency shows lack of experience and consideration if one is to be called before daylight it is wise to give one's self ample time for dressing and so the porter should be instructed to call one at a certain time considerably ahead of the hour for leaving the train experienced women travellers do not don white night dresses in sleeping cars but keep a dark silk robe for this purpose ensuring equal comfort and a better appearance in case of illness or accident there are many small offices for which one may call upon the porter if so inclined one must however keep it in mind that he should be rewarded proportionately at the end of the journey after he has performed his last office of brushing one off twenty-five cents is the usual amount given to him for the services rendered in twenty-four hours an occasional wary traveller bestows his tip for the first rather than the last service if a porter appears sullen this method will be found to have advantages before leaving one's berth in the morning one should as far as possible get into one's undergarments over which one slips a bathrobe or kimono before going to the toilet room one should take with one to the toilet comb brush toothbrush clothesbrush washcloth a cake of soap it is never wise to use the public cake and the gown one intends wearing with its accessories all the toilet articles should be carried in a silk waterproof companion or better still in a crash apron with rubber lined pockets for soap and towels to be tied about the waist arrived there one should be as expeditious as possible in order not to keep others waiting one woman's selfishness in outstaying her time in the toilet room may keep ten others in misery it is not the time and place for a complete bath nowhere is the quality of true courtesy more needed than in the toilet room of a pullman when one has finished one's ablutions combed one's hair and fastened one's gown one should clean the basin and place the soiled towels out of the way when one leaves the room it should be ready for the next comer in the dining car when the announcement is made that breakfast dinner or luncheon as the case may be is served 
the passenger makes his way to the diner if this is crowded he must wait his time patiently and with courtesy to those about him sometimes the meal is served a la carte literally by the card in which case a separate charge is made for each article on the bill of fare or menu menu by the way is pronounced menu not menu as one often hears it many dining cars serve meals table d'hote and for these a fixed charge of one dollar is made some train dinners are very good indeed others are execrable if a dish is particularly bad and one complaint does not produce a better the diner should not browbeat his waiter who is not to blame but may if he choose speak to the steward in charge having been served he should fee the waiter the usual fee is one-tenth the price of the meal though men more frequently than women give more than this arriving at a hotel arrival in a strange city is bewildering to a person who has travelled little there are always however in the city railway stations bureaus of information where one may find out the necessary things if one is desirous of a cab one may discover there the most trustworthy line or if a car is wanted what direction one must take to find the proper one usually the traveller if intending to go to a hotel will have made himself acquainted before arrival in the city with the relative value and expense of the different ones a person is much better treated at such places if he writes or telegraphs ahead for accommodations a woman should choose the side entrance if there is one as this is reserved for ladies if a woman arrives in a strange city unaccompanied it is sometimes difficult for her to get the hotel accommodations she desires at some hotels they will not admit unaccompanied women after nightfall under these circumstances the traveller would better go to hostelries established by the young women's christian association where she may feel certain of the character of the place and entertainment these places invariably require that one shall be introduced and one will do well therefore to take a letter from one's clergyman the length of one stay is usually limited but it is sufficient for the ordinary holiday or shopping visit the unaccompanied woman if you are arriving in a city and expect to be met do not if you can possibly avoid it take a train that pulls in at an unearthly hour of the night or early morning if you must take such a train tell your hostess that she is not to meet you that you will stay the night at a downtown hotel or at least will take a carriage an intelligent woman need have no fear of danger in arriving in a strange city alone she may possibly be annoyed by a bold stare even by a question but the chances are that if she be quiet in dress and manner she will not suffer even inconvenience policemen and station officials are always willing to answer the questions of perplexed travellers a little fee sometimes helps them speak more eloquently it is not wise to depend upon the chance passer-by for information the person whose business it is to inform you is not likely to tell you what is untrue of him you have a right to expect something of others you have a right to expect nothing and you may come in for less than the value of your expectations on board a boat the general etiquette of steamboat travel does not differ from that on board a train boat travel is of a more leisurely sort and begets somewhat less formality as relates to one's fellow travellers otherwise the rules of behaviour are the same as a parting injunction to the traveller let me say don't look worried cross and over careful even if you feel that way courtesy to subordinates will win you attention and service will straighten out your difficulties more quickly than any other method 
if you take the ills of travelling with some sense of humour with a give-and-take spirit you will get more than the benefit of the money your journey may cost you if you do not carry an elastic spirit with you the finest trip that ever was planned will bring you little return chaperones in europe a woman who travels abroad must remember that the rules of chaperonage are much stricter in europe than they are in this country and that she is expected to have a companion or a maid if she wishes to dispense with these she must reconcile herself to foregoing social invitations if she makes inquiry she can always learn of particularly desirable pensions where she may count on finding among the guests a congenial person to accompany her on many of her short excursions on board the steamship the luckiest passengers in the dining salon are those who are fortunate enough to be allotted seats at the captain's table End of section twenty seven